Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for joining us today for the first issue briefing of the third day of the World Economic Forum on Africa, 2000, and please, ma'am, yeah. 2015. This is the 25th anniversary, of course, of the World Economic Forum's uh, meetings on Africa. And um, one of the most important subjects of this and many recent meetings has been the issue of inclusive growth and income inequality. So the purpose of this, uh, this session here is to look into fair financing and investment for inclusive growth in Africa. We've got a very, very esteemed panel talking. I'm going to keep my remarks, as always, to a minimum for your, for your own health and, and goodness. Um, on my immediate left is Eddie Ompodu, Regional Activism and Youth Coordinator for Africa, Amnesty International. He's going to outline the Africa Not For Sale campaign, which tackles a lot of these issues head on. Uh, after Eddie, of course, Winnie Bianima, Executive Director, Oxfam International, um, a great champion of the cause, um, has a lot to say on the issue. She was a co-chair at our annual meeting in Davos in 2015. Jennifer Blanke, Chief Economist at the World Economic Forum, has been leading research uh, we're doing here at the Forum into inclusive growth and looking at ways policymakers and other actors can intervene positively to drive growth, but good quality inclusive growth. And last but not least, Primzile, Malambu and Kuka, I'm very proud uh, to, to say as our co-chair this year's meeting, welcome, Mom, uh, the Executive Director of UN Women, and again, a very vocal supporter uh, of this cause. Eddie, I'm going to ask you first of all to talk a little bit about your campaign. For sure. So uh, from the vantage point of a 25-year-old human rights uh, activist, um, as well as an advocate of youth rights, I will start by saying that inclusion is non-negotiable. It is a moral and political imperative. Uh, and so the Africa Not For Sale campaign is a youth-led campaign for corporate accountability in the social and economic lives of young people throughout Africa. The Africa Not For Sale campaign is motivated by the realization that the Africa Rising narrative when looked at through the lens of human rights is in contradiction oftentimes with the reality on the ground. Um, and, and this contradiction disproportionately affects uh, Africa's youth who have been left behind. Uh, as many of us know, by the year 2025, one in four young people will be from sub-Saharan Africa. Yet when we look at, uh, within the context of the human rights landscape, young people are often disenfranchised along the lines of, of unemployment, uh, poverty, and inequality. Um, and so it is this contradiction, this disjuncture between rhetoric and practice, uh, which we seek to address through the Africa Not For Sale campaign. And so our campaign is important because it seeks to peel back the layers of the Africa rising narrative and reveal the truth that is buried beneath the hype, that Africa cannot possibly rise without Africans themselves rising as well that growth that is premised on exploitation and economic devastation is not the sort of growth worth promoting. So through the Africa Not For Sale campaign, um, young people, uh, Africa's youth, we are saying that development and justice are not mutually exclusive, but rather are an interlocking, interlocking part of the development process. Africa Not For Sale is important because simply put, the future of Africa's youth is at stake if we do not address and amplify our collective voice. When we talk about Africa not for sale, we do not mean that Africa is not for investment. Rather, we are calling for investment that is predicated on ethical, transparent, accountable, and youth-inclusive uh, modes um, of governance. Africa's youth are not seeking permission from any individual or any institution, we are diagnosing the problem and prescribing solutions. Accordingly, through the Africa Not For Sale campaign, we are calling on multinational corporations and African leaders to stop auctioning off our future in the name of a growth model that is exclusionary um, and, and expand Africa Rising to ensure that human development and human rights is promoted at the forefront of a regional agenda. Africa, um, Amnesty International convened a two-day roundtable dialogue in April where we invited young human rights champions from across Africa to think through uh, the state of Africa's youth in the era of Africa rising. 
And so we developed five recommendations that we seek to promote as part and parcel of this campaign. We are going after the future we want. And what do we want? We want a mobile Africa. We, we, we are calling on leaders to open, uh, to open up Africa's borders uh, and develop and implement progressive migration policies in the interest of a mobile continent in order to protect and promote freedom of movement, mobility rights, and the right to travel. We want an online Africa. We, we, we want leaders to promote and protect the right to information and the, and the right to access justice through, through the development and adoption of an AU charter on internet rights and freedom in the interests of an online Africa. We want an ethical and transparent Africa. We, seek to, we, we would like leaders to promote and strengthen the regulation of illicit financial flows and corporate tax avoidance through the establishment of an independent continental body that monitors and, and tracks such practices in the interest of an ethical and transparent Africa. We want a non-disposable Africa. We want our leaders to promote and strengthen the regulation of large-scale land acquisitions through the establishment of an independent continental body that monitors and tracks land grabs and forced evictions in the interest of an Africa where communities are not disposed of and their right to life is protected. And finally, we want an imaginative Africa. We want our leaders to promote and protect the rights, to, to promote and protect the arts as a site for the promotion of freedom of expression through, the inve through investment in the creative industries in the interest of cultivating an imaginative Africa that is grounded in human rights. So ladies and gentlemen, I will say to you that Africa's future is at stake, but having said that, I am very optimistic because young people throughout the continent are amplifying their voices and we are going after the future we want. Thank you. Winnie, what are your views on the fair international development financing and um, the other, okay. other, other campaigns that you're, uh, you're leading which will hopefully drive us towards fairer financing and investment for inclusive growth? Thank you, Oli. Is this working? It is working. It should be. <clears throat> and um, I really concur with everything that Ndopu has said so eloquently. And fellow panelists, I'm very pleased to be on this panel today that puts the people of Africa front and center, young people and women in particular. Because what is growth for if it's not to help ordinary people to thrive? I want to start my remarks by noting that the global inequality crisis has taken root here in Africa as well, just as it has across the world. When I co-chaired the World Economic Forum annual meeting in Davos early this year, I told the media that 80 people in the world have the same combined wealth as the 3.5 billion poorest. Now, the World Bank has found that the 10 richest Africans own the same as the poorest half of the continent, over half a billion people. 10, you can count on my hands, own as much as the poorest half of the continent, 500 million people. And amongst these, of course, it's women who are hit hardest. In Sub-Saharan Africa, because they earn 30% less than men. So this whole thing begs, the, this whole narrative of Africa rising begs the question, rising for who? Rising with who? So there are many of us who seek to challenge the idea that inequality is an inevitable consequence of growth and development in Africa. Oxfam is challenging this with our Even It Up campaign. But we're not alone. We are witnessing an important shift in thinking and a growing recognition that inequality is not the unfortunate price of strong economic growth. It's actually bad for growth. It slows growth. And inequality is not just a problem for those at the bottom, it harms us all. Oxfam produced a report this week that warns that too much of Africa's 
growth is failing to reach its poorest people. Part of this, we can blame it to the corrosive relationship between wealth and power that undermines our politics. It is wrong that in Africa, so many leaders use their government positions to amass great personal wealth, and in turn, they use that wealth to influence politics. This is wrong, but it's happening across the continent. It's also the case, though, that Africa is still losing a lot of money through a global financing system that makes our continent a net creditor to the rest of the world. Oxfam has found that Africa was cheated out of $11 billion in 2010 through what is called trade mispricing. This is just one of the tricks used by multinational companies to reduce their tax bills, just one of their tricks. This 11 billion is equivalent to more than six times the amount of money you would need to provide primary health care to the four countries that are hit by Ebola, Sierra Leone, Liberia, Guinea, and Guinea-Bissau. Six times the amount of money to solve the health problems of those four countries, health care, was lost just through one trick that the international multinationals can use to get out their profits without being taxed. So add to this all the other avo tax avoidance tricks and other ways of illicit that, that illicit financial flows happen, add in tax incentives, tax breaks, tax holidays, and so on, it's clear that unless we tackle these, the rich world is gaining most from Africa's progress. It's not the ordinary people. So next month, the Financing for Development Conference is taking place on this continent in Addis Ababa. It's critical that our leaders go there and demand for a reform of the global tax system, the closing of these loopholes that enable Africa <clears throat> to lose. I will end by highlighting three things that we urge African ministers to do in Addis Ababa. First, to turn up, to turn up at a high level, to give strong political participation, be there at the head of state level, or at least minister of finance level. Two, put their weight behind the call for real global tax reform of that global tax system. In particular, demand for an intergovernmental tax body that includes all countries as equal members to establish international tax cooperation and to stop this tax uh, evasion and avoidance through harmful tax competition. Third, put the money towards reducing economic and social inequalities and poverty. This means spending on public services, giving our people quality health care, quality education, our young people, and invest in sustainable agriculture, small-scale food production, and citizens' efforts to hold their governments accountable. I thank you. Thank you, Winnie. Jennifer, we've um, at the forum been flagging income inequality and our global risks now, I think since 2010. So it's been rising up on the radar um, amongst the, the, you know, the communities that we convene at our annual meetings and, and, and virtually throughout the year. Um, that's led to you and, and your team here at the forum leading a, a research project on inclusive growth. Tell us a bit, a bit more about that. Okay. Um, well, I just say that it's definitely true that income inequality has been high on the forum's agenda for some time. Uh, and it's true that it has come through the Global Risks Report, uh, which has placed income inequality, excessive income inequality, at the top of the risks uh, for several years, as you mentioned. And this is because it's so, well, it's, it's, a, it's an excessively um, dangerous risk, but also that it's highly interlinked with a lot of other risks, socioeconomic risks, uh, things such as, you know, obviously unemployment and underemployment, but also uh, excessive, you know, issues in, in the society, such as societal unrest. Um, but it's important to keep in mind that, you know, although that has come up as an important risk, 
Um, business leaders and political leaders in Davos and elsewhere have been telling us that they want us to work on this issue because they're seeing it as a bottom line and top line issue right now. Uh, and this is because not only does it have a potential impact on you know, societal unrest, but it's just affecting things like consumption. When you ha you're squeezing the middle class, people are not even you know, consuming. And so it's basically pretty much mathematically holding back uh, growth. And so this is something that we've been looking at very closely uh, in work that we've been doing with uh, my colleague Gemma, uh, who's in the front row. And if people have interesting uh, or questions uh, later, uh, Gemma can, can give some details. Um, but basically, you know, um, everybody knows that they want inclusive growth. We've he heard this a lot at the meeting uh, over the last few days, but it's not clear what to do about it. A lot of people have different ideas, uh, but what do you do in terms of actual policy levers uh, to take care of it? And that's what we're really trying to understand in this work. Um, because if you think about it, if you think about sort of inclusiveness and growth, and if you thought about a Venn diagram with two circles and what is the you know, overlapping shaded area, there's actually a lot more in there uh, than you'd expect. A lot of people will talk about taxation and transfers, uh, or they'll talk about you know, eventually education. That has come up a lot. And those things are important, but there are many other things that are very important, both for driving growth uh, and uh, for improving uh, inclusivity uh, in the economy. And these are things you know, that I think are obvious, but people don't necessarily think about, uh, such as a lack of corruption. There's nothing worse, I think, if you think about something that's driving exclusion, as well as holding back growth as, as uh, corruption in the economy, for example. Um, you know, uh, entrepreneurship, great for growth as well as inclusion. Um, access to basic services and so on and so forth. So what we're doing is we're laying out the landscape of the different policy levers and efforts that can be made by business and government and civil society in order to improve inclusivity. And we'll be coming out with that report in early September. Uh, so that will really be our contribution. So then what are we going to do with this? I mean, we're a platform for discussion. That's what's happening here right now. So what we'll do is we'll pull all this together also with the work on, on competitiveness. That's sort of our traditional analysis of productivity enhancers. Uh, and we're putting together what we're calling um, a global challenge initiative which is a really a priority of the World Economic Forum. We've picked nine or 10 areas that we're really gonna focus on. Uh, uh, economic growth and social inclusion is one of those where we will pull all of this together also with some good practices that we're, we're identifying uh, together with Harvard and a few other um, of our partners uh, in order to really put some meat on the bones of this. You know, what do you actually do about it? Uh, and, uh, and so I think throughout the next year, and actually I'd say throughout the, probably the next several years, uh, we'll be convening discussions, uh, both at the global le level and also at the regional level, uh, in order to understand and try to you know, spur actual projects uh, that will improve uh, social inclusion uh, and inclusive growth and have a better understanding of what uh, actually drives that. Um, I mean, clearly it's been uh, a huge topic of conversation uh, here. It's come up over and over again, and what we're hoping is that in the next couple of years we'll have a much better understanding of what actually does drive inclusive growth in different countries, uh, and that uh, will uh, help uh, in, in the process of actually um, making some progress in that area. Thanks, Jennifer. We all often hear, of course, of the need for data. If you can't measure, you can't improve. Pumzile Mlambu and Kuka, again, this is a, a topic dear to your heart. Tell us a bit about what the work you're doing at UN Women. Um, well, I mean, I think uh, maybe to start by saying that uh, of the biggest problems that we're dealing with in the 21st century and uh, what we aspire to achieve cannot be achieved without us addressing this, in, this issue of inclusive development and growth, whether we're talking about environmental degradation, whether we are talking about uh, sustainably and uh, you know, significantly addressing poverty, whether we are talking about uh, uh, closing the inequality gap and whether we're talking about uh, having sustainable peace. These are all of the big issues that are dominating us. And there is no way uh, we can really address these issues. If you think about environmental degradation, this is a people's issue. People need to be resilient in order for them to survive environmental disasters, but also to protect the environment. If we do not invest significantly in education, if we do not significantly invest in infrastructure that also protects the environment so that uh, women and girls are not uh, expected to be the ones that must shoulder res the responsibility of absence of, of, of energy, the converse of that, with that uh, we exacerbate environmental degradation. If we talk about uh, uh, poverty, 
And as Winnie was saying, the fact that you've got so many poor people and so few that have got uh, uh, the means, not unless we, inv we invest significantly in the distribu redistribution of resources through public goods, education, health, in order to make more people to be able to fight to fend for themselves and to rise within what is possible in, the, in their countries, these big 21st century issues would not be addressed. And if we talk about peace, I think something that uh, for us in Africa is also a big issue because we've got so many conflict uh, flashpoints. Uh, we have so much of radicalization of, of young people. We, have, we see so many young people in Africa trying to run away from Africa, mm. prepared to die in the middle of the sea, running away from their own continent. I mean, how can we have a situation where our young people are being put through, and women and everybody, through so much trauma, and, and yet we do not have a, you know, a bigger plan of how we're going to, 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 to address this. So I guess the, the kind of work that we are trying to do as the UN and, um, and UN Women is to work with the constituency that is most affected, which is one that we have a mandate to service, which is, uh, which is women. And we cannot do that effectively, not unless the policies of, that we adopt in our countries and that the private sector also has got an appetite to actually make these changes uh, uh, happen. So some of the policies that we are uh, wanting our governments uh, to, to adopt uh, on, 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 on the continent would start with ensuring that, for instance, as we are moving towards the Sustainable Development Goal, we've got to invest in girls' education so that we do not have so many girls that are dropping out of school so that uh, we do not have so many girls that uh, are likely to have early pregnancies and that we do not have so many girls that are likely to be victims of early marriages. Uh, in many of our countries, even where we have legislation, the legislation is not deliberate enough, it's not being implemented enough, so we still have these uh, abuses uh, um, uh, on the girls. The same thing, if we do not have the girls uh, in significant numbers getting into the mainstream economy, becoming uh, vibrant citizens, the kind of uh, energy that is required to make the pie bigger for everybody is not gonna happen. I know you've got your press for time. So I guess the point that I'm saying is that the deliberateness of the policies so that they address these issues, we don't treat them as side issues because there's a tendency to think that issues around youth, issues around women, these are not mainstream issues. The mainstream issues is foreign direct investment. Mm -hmm. Youth is the mainstream, women is the mainstream, and that is what we have to be much more deliberate about. And then the other things are going to fall into place. I think that's the short story for me. Targeting and being deliberate. Thank you. Now, we have to have a hard finish at half past. Any questions? Gentleman here, please. Hi, good morning. Um, Could you just give, give us your name, sir, and where you're from? Andre Leroux from Namibia. Um, we talk about inclusive growth, and you pointed out FDI, but, um, and the criteria sometimes is good governance, um, inclusive uh, growth in economies, yet you find that certain countries, uh, only certain countries in Africa get the FDI. Uh, how do you change that focus that, that, that's to um, promote um, growth in all of Africa? How do we channel FDI towards inclusivity? Anyone like to take a stab at that, Winnie? I think that you have to understand how uh, investors see a country for their investment. It, it's very important that, first of all, we tackle unhealthy tax competition. Because some of it is driven by really putting countries in a situation where they are racing to the bottom, giving uh, literally permission to companies to generate, to do their economic activity without being taxed. So we need to plug that loophole of unhealthy tax competition. It requires that our countries cooperate and establish some rules that don't push them to do that. 
That's one. But two, also our countries must be hospitable to people. An investor is a human being who wants to come with his family, put his kids to school, go to a nice restaurant, and enjoy life. Some of our countries, people cannot live properly, cannot live dignified lives because of repression, because of denial of rights. You, you cannot read a newspaper. The paper must write only about the president and his family. It cannot criticize. So uh, having a free environment where people have free speech, freedom of movement, association, these rights are important for investors too. So I think it's about that enabling environment. And uh, investors like to think in enabling environment as an environment where they don't pay taxes. Mm. For me, an enabling environment is one where people enjoy freedom to be creative. Jennifer, do you want to make a very quick comment there? I want to yeah. save time for this gentleman here. OK, I would just add to that that um, there's one thing that's very important in Africa, which is it's clear that the FDI has mostly gone either to the oil producers, maybe that's going down a little bit, or to South Africa. Um, but a, a lot of this is because these are very small economies, right? And in order to attract more investors, I think regional integration is critical, um, which includes you know, investment in infrastructure, et cetera. But in order to make you know, the investments viable, uh, Africa really needs to, to, to work on this. And that's also good for growth more generally. I mean, this is like the, the free movement of people mm -hmm. you know, that we were talking about earlier. I say that's one thing. The other thing is very practically something that's being discussed a lot and that I think is going to be discussed in Addis uh, next month is the whole idea of things like blended finance. I mean, you have got to make it less risky for investors to invest. You know, they, they have to feel that they're actually investing in something where they're going to recoup something afterwards. And, and so, you know, I think a combination of some of the things that Africa can do for itself and then what the investment community can do and, and I'd say, you know, some of the international institutions and the governments in order to make it more attractive and, and, and less risky to invest. Thanks. Uh, sir? It will work. I'm Arthur from Eden FM in George. <clears throat> Dr. Nunga, you mentioned that it's very important to invest in girls' education. Don't you think it's going to be difficult to invest, for, especially, for example, in South Africa, we have rural areas in the mm -hmm. Eastern Cape, and, for example, in town, there are those areas yeah, in town. Don't you think it will be difficult to reach those living in rural areas, to invest to those who are living in rural areas? Uh, you mean by foreign investors? Well, I don't know if the rural development has to be the responsibility of a foreign investor. I think that it, that has to be the responsibility of our, of our governments. Uh, uh, but I think uh, the important uh, piece for the investor in what happens in the rural areas is the supply of skills. If our governments uh, are able to invest in rural areas, in the development of the people, in enhanced human capital, then uh, it means that uh, from the rural areas we can actually get people who have got the skills that the investors are, are looking for. And then of course the improvement of infrastructure. If you think about mining, most of the mines uh, are located in the most rural and isolated area and infrastructure uh, helps uh, for them to be, to be accessible. And uh, we also need to, in the case of South Africa, where we do have legislation that requires them to invest in the locality, in, the, in communities where their mines occur, uh, they can invest in those communities so that the mine is not an isolated isle uh, of prosperity around a community that has got nothing. And again, the, we have to enforce the laws that uh, we have, which requires the mines to do that. Very, very quickly, Winnie. We have to ask the question also, who is an investor? Mm. The African farmer is an investor and is investing on his land, his labor, and producing what Africa exports. But this one, the foreign investor, comes, gets free land many times, is allowed to exp externalize his profits, gets concessionary loans, has it all, both from governments, from lending institutions, what does the farmer get? The African farmer. That's the real investor who should be invested in to increase his productivity. So really, governments need to step up in supporting the smallholder farmer, particularly the woman farmer, helping them with the infrastructure, the water, 
the energy for rural uh, productivity, technology. the technology. I mean, the credit for farmers, all that is not there. They are, they are investing, but they are unsupported. Thank you, Winnie. Um, I do, we are running over time hideously, but I do want to go back to Eddie uh, and your campaign. Yeah. A lot of things you mentioned, you know, mobility, better online access, digital, digital dividend, creative industries. This is a lot of governance, good regulation, transparency. It's a lot of, a, lot of a shared agenda with business. Mm -hmm. have you, have you, uh, are you uh, having any good progress talking to the business community with your campaign so far? Well, yes, um, but I think part of our call to action is to ensure that there is active and meaningful participation of young people. So it's not just a question of listening to young people, but actually having young people in the decision-making process where they're able to amplify their voice accordingly. And so I think part of the challenge with the youth engagement discourse is that we often um, have young people participating on the sidelines, but are rarely seen as agents um, of, of, of the agents of the, of the development process. And so um, that's, that, that is at the heart of the campaign. So they're speaking with business leaders, speaking with government leaders, speaking with civil society leaders to ensure that we're not just listening to young people, but actively amplifying our collective voice so that we're part of that decision-making process. Thank you, Eddie. Well, thank you all very, very much indeed. Thank you for joining us, and thank you also to our audience online. This issue briefing is now closed. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's fascinating. Thank you. Thanks, Eddie. Thank you so much.